tell us your name, kind of give us a little bit of an outline of your life. Where are you from? Where are you now? And what is it that you do specifically? Okay, so my name is Ronnie Garza, and um, I am a um, documentary filmmaker. Uh, I was born in Brownsville, and so that's where I'm from, and I uh, eventually moved to McAllen when I was like a teenager. I did go to UTRGV. That's where I got my degree from. Um, that's where I finished college. I was, I was up at UNT up in Denton um, when I started college. I was there for a while. And uh, I actually moved out there because I was interested in film. I had started a film club back in high school, um, back at SciTech. I went to SciTech for high school and I started a film club out there. And so I wanted to keep on making film. And so that's kind of why I wound up at UNT. Uh, and I got disinterested in film because it seemed too complicated and too many moving parts. And so I kind of focused on music for the longest time. Um, uh, me and my co-director for As I Walk Through the Valley, Charlie Vela, um, we kind of grew up in the in the punk scene together in um, in the 90s, in the late 90s. And so we've both been um, uh, pretty interested in music uh, for um, for the longest time. And so I kind of focused on music for forever, but I did uh, a lot of like multimedia art um, and uh, when I was at UNT, I kind of started doing um, the Art Walk back in like 2007, or back when I was at UTRGV rather. And uh, and so I, I, I would do like video stuff um, and um, sound stuff, and I would do like installation stuff. And so I was doing like more multimedia art, and um, it wasn't until I started doing a lot of um, political kind of like journalism, like video journalism, uh, up in Austin when I when I was living in Austin around 2000 and um, I started around 2012 2013 uh, doing the videos that I got back into video so they started making a bunch of like politically related videos um, first related to stuff that was happening out of the Capitol with Wendy Davis and the abortion legislation mm -hmm. then I moved back to the valley in like 2014 I started making videos um, related to um, immigration and and um, uh, the uh, asylum seekers at that time back in 2014 um and after doing a series of videos like that i, I kind of felt like i wanted to do something more um entertainment or more um popular culture and that's when i um uh, talked with my friend charlie uh and we started doing um uh, we started doing as i walked through the valley all right cool Okay, so growing up, was filmmaking something that you knew you always wanted to do? And in terms of film, what or who were your major influences? And has that evolved now? Sure. So um, film, uh, filmmaking was a, a pretty a big interest from high school. Uh, that's where I kind of uh, really first developed um, a serious interest in it and started watching a lot of films and started following a lot of directors and, and things like that. Um, I wouldn't say like, from you know before then, but definitely by high school, I thought that film, art, and multimedia in general was um, was something I was really interested in. And so, um, uh, as I mentioned before, I kind of got disinterested in film at a certain point and just kind of focused on on my my music output. Um, but uh, I've gotten back into it, especially because um, I was more interested in like experimental film and abstract film. But I've gotten much more interested in narrative and storytelling, uh, and also its impact on um, its impact on um, politics and culture. And so, since since I kind of saw that, so I saw that that um, story storytelling and um, and narrative uh, could have an impact on politics or culture. That's when I really got much more serious about it. And then, like influences. Um, would be people like Werner Herzog, um, Stanley Kubrick, um, I, I don't know, like, um, there's, a, there's a ton, P.T. Anderson, um, I don't know. I mean, really, there's, there's so many. Gaspar Noe is a really interesting new filmmaker. Lars von Trier, like, I was really into the Dogma 95 movement and, um, and stuff similar to the French New Wave. Um, stuff that was really stripped down, stuff that was like low tech and that was like really acting and story driven. I, I, I've been really into, um, I was really into the Dogma 95 movement back in, um, back in high school. And it had to do with the, had to do with the, this um, uh, set of filmmakers in 1995 that created this set of rules that you could only shoot on digital 
and there was no lights and there was no special effects and there's all these like real strict rules to it but it was to make it like all about the story so i became super interested in in that uh in that kind of approach so yeah those are some of them cool okay so i guess i'm gonna veer into the documentary um as i walk through the valley um what was the inspiration for the documentary how long did it take to research the timeline of the film was it difficult organizationally speaking to gather everyone's involvement okay so um i was sort of um i was kind of hitting a dead end when it came to the political videos that i was making the sort of video journalism that i was doing back in 2014 and so um I felt like I wanted to do something a little bit more commercial. And, um, and I believe, and I, and, and I was watching some other documentary at the time, but I believe that, um, you know, this, this documentary, As I Walk Through the Valley, is sort of connected with um, notions of, um, uh, if you go back to like the, the 60s and you think about like the African-American civil rights movement and, People like Stokely Carmichael saying black is beautiful, like the, the notion of uh, uh, highlighting or, um, uh, yeah, I mean, like highlighting the excellence of communities that are being currently marginalized. I felt like that was an approach to still doing politics. I mean, it's all, it, all of these documentaries that I've been working on are kind of different angles at impacting culture or politics. Um, Steve Bannon calls it the Breitbart Doctrine. Um, before that, people referred to like culture jamming and stuff, but um, uh, some some people believe that uh, politics was downstream from culture. That that culture kind of really informs politics, and uh, and so that was always kind of like a part of it. How to how to still be politically active, um, but through media, and how to do it in the valley. And and with at the time, um, there was a lot of negative talk about immigrants and there's a lot of talk about um uh you know rapists and murderers and all, the, all this other stuff kind of talking about uh, mexicans mexican americans and immigrants and stuff like that and and so it seemed like uh one way to um fight that uh more or less would be to highlight the um the like the beauty of of uh, the people down here and and um and the culture and and also something modern, something that was not um, like conjunto music or uh, uh, regional music and, and stuff like that, because that's kind of already been covered. And that's kind of like an older era. And the newer era, like the current era is much more, in a way, like, it's much more um, connected with American popular culture. And that, that's what I grew up in. That's what the people that I knew grew up in. And so I wanted to kind of like find something that reflected that. So that was, um, that was a big part of the motivation of, of um, trying to do something like that. And so when I um, when I approached Charlie uh, about it, um, that was that was the idea, and we were going to kind of focus on the late '90s because we grew up in this uh, late '90s punk scene that was all about it was like super democratic. It was called the Union, and it was all about like um, uh, it was very explicitly about the group and the communal kind of aspect of it, and there was voting. And um, there was a lot of kind of egalitarian sentiment to it. There was a manifesto that kind of started the whole thing off. So that's that was sort of what I thought would be the end. Like, oh, we'll talk about music, we'll talk about punk, but you can't talk about it without the rest of the of the culture aspects coming into it. But we wound up expanding the thing as we found out that the first punk band didn't start in the '90s like we thought. But the first punk band didn't uh, didn't uh, start until like 1980 in the valley, and so it, that kind of took us further and further back. And then we expanded a little bit further back into the 60s for different reasons. But that's kind of how we got started. Um, uh, I forgot I forget if there was another question attached to that. Oh yes. Uh, how long did it take to research the the timeline uh, of the film? Because right. So so yeah. I mean, like I said, originally we were going to do this late 90s thing and. Uh, then as we kept going further and further back, like we kept on talking to more people and more people and more people. We did a lot of searching online um, as well, but uh, we started in 2014 and it was finished by, it premiered at South by Southwest in 2017 in March. So um, 
really it was like 15 and 16 like those two years were the the two main years that we were researching the thing and doing it mm -hmm. was it hard though getting everyone's involvement like how how would you have gone about contacting people i mean the logistics of that is like seems for sure pretty... yeah i mean it was it, it was pretty natural though because uh, we started off with people that we knew in the late 90s scene and then they connected us with slightly older people and then um, further and further back but there was like there were moments when we just cold called people i remember charlie found a video online um this dude had put up uh jaime from the from uh, the innkeeper band and um and charlie just found this video online and was like this guy is like he's writing in the art period and he's doing this really interesting uh documentation himself and so he just kind of reached out to him through youtube um and so there were some there were some moments like that where we just kind of cold called people and like oh we saw you mentioned on this blog the 60s blog or something like that it's like would you be interested or through facebook like friend of a friend kind of thing but a lot of it was just through our contacts we started with the contacts that we knew they connected with us older people and then those older people would connect us with the who we, who else we needed to talk to that was most of it So I wrote down a, a quick question. Have you seen any uh, progression in the way that pe people view our small valley after the release of your film? Like, has there any been, has, sorry, has there been any positive feedback from its, after its release? I think we saw a lot of positive feedback, really. I mean, there's a lot of articles written about it. Um, we got like a little blurb in the New York Times before it even came out, so people were kind of interested. We got write-ups in Texas Monthly, La Mescla, um, I don't know, a bunch of different other ones. The Monitor did a write-up at one point. So I think a lot of people were interested, um, and, and especially like the folks that were in it, um, I think that they were happy to have their stories told. When we premiered it in the Valley, like we, we did the world premiere at South by Southwest, but then after that, we did a Valley premiere um, in April of that year. And there's something like 700 people came out. Uh, it may have been even a little bit more than that. Um, and then we had a big show that, that night with like um, five bands. So it was like a kind of a really big turnout. So I think, I think people liked it. Um, and uh, we've, we've shown it at uh, universities. We've shown it at Michigan State University. We also showed it at Stanford University. We showed it um, um, not at the university, but in collaboration with UNT. So we showed it in Denton as well. So other universities have gotten interested in it and also purchased copies for their libraries. So um, I, think, I think we've seen a lot of positive uh, response from it. So were you partial to any decades when researching? How was the experience when having conversations and hanging out with musicians of older generations? You know, that, that really kind of changed over time. I mean, I'm, I was pretty jazzed about all the decades. Um, I would say that I was least interested in the 70s when we originally started off. Uh, it was originally kind of like this punk thing, but then um, right before we had gotten started, the, there were all these um, 45s that were selling on eBay. Um, for a lot of money and like uh, Faro Records became kind of like this hot commodity and um, at the time in like 2012, 13, 14, like there's a lot of neo 60s stuff going on. There's a lot of like neo psychedelia and I was living in Austin so like Levitation Fest was going pretty strong um, and uh, since then there's like more bands that were kind of in this uh, garage band, garage rock kind of sound. So we thought it'd be kind of interesting um, kind of throwback that was kind of back in vogue, like to go back to the 60s, especially since the Faro 45s were, were seeming to be such this um, uh, sought after thing. So we went back to this, we went back into the 60s and all of the eras seemed really interesting, but the 70s, I would say the 70s surprised me because I wasn't super interested in covering the 70s. I'm not super interested in like Spanish music and things like that and conjunto and things, things of that nature. But we learned a lot, and we learned that like the early Tejano music was called Chicano music, and the early Chicano music was basically like proto-punk in a way, because it was um, very um, uh, class conscious. That that the uh, Tejano music, uh, or, or rather the its earlier form, Chicano music, um, was about kind of celebrating the culture, and when the whole world or the whole rest of the United States was sort of starting to get, move into uh, 
disco and, and things kind of like that in the 70s, along the border, there was this, um, um, there were these, there were these sixties bands that were kind of rebaptizing themselves as these Latin bands. Um, that's where you have um, like the Latin airs and Steve Jordan was doing, you know, a bunch of different stuff in, in the fifties and sixties. Um, but, but you, you have this, this kind of transition into like, okay, we're going to do Spanish language music now because we're brand pride because we're, we're supporting um, the community in, so, in, in a certain kind of way. And um, so that, that turned out to be kind of one of the more interesting eras uh, in retrospect, because it, uh, it's, it's unique to this region. And for me, it kind of like gave me a different perspective on, on uh, the origins of uh, Tejano music and that it was more connected with the, um, with, uh, the political movement of that time. And it eventually it kind of grows and becomes this more commercial thing, but uh, it's, it's an inception. It's uh, the way it originates was, um, was different. And, and, and for me, that was, that was really exciting. Okay, so I think you touched up on it um, at the beginning, but just to reiterate, uh, what were your initial visions for the documentary? And did the end result differ at all from what you expected, talking from a logistical standpoint, but also an emotional one? Yeah, I mean, we wanted to cover the region, uh, the region's music, and also explore the region through the music. I mean, to me, that was really important is that it wasn't just like a music documentary. It was a documentary about the valley, but we were using music as a way to sh show off the valley, to showcase it. Um, <clears throat> so... I think we did a decent job of that. There were things that I feel like that were failings that I wish we had covered more of Mexico. We do cover Mexico and, and Reynosa and Matamos and stuff like that, but I wish we had done more of that. Um, I also think we could have spent more time on metal. <laughs> there, are thing, there are things that when I go back and I watch it, I was like, I wish that were different about it. Um, but at the same time, like you have to eventually just kind of call it a day at a certain point. Uh, but it definitely expanded in terms of its scope. It was originally like a, a late 90s thing because we thought that all of the bands started in the late 90s or the middle 90s or something because uh, we were just so completely uninformed. Um, but then we expanded it out. So it, it turned into like a maybe like a five to eight year kind of focus to a 40 year focus. And that really did change logistically how to cut it. And um, But that was a big learning process in itself, learning how to cut a feature length. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, those are some of the, the things that changed along the way. Did the film allow for any insight at all as far as where music and other artistic cultures will be even further in the future? Oh, like insight into the future. Um, I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. Um, I definitely think that as we looked in, in the past that our music tracked along with American popular music we always say we're sort of like 10 years behind or 15 years behind the Valley. And to a certain extent it's true. Um, but uh, I do expect music in the Valley to continue to track popular trends, but we may see certain um, idiosyncrasies uh, related to our, our uh, geography. So like just the fact that we're along the border may introduce just like in the seventies era may introduce something novel along uh that that happens along the border region but otherwise i do more or less expect it to continue um tracking with uh, american popular culture wherever the american trends are the valley trends will, will continue and um yeah so i i don't know any other insight besides that to a certain extent it's kind of unpredictable where music goes i actually just want to say i really really did like the documentary um I'm not a very musical person. My dad is a musician and so is my boyfriend. So I know what it's like to be at least in the crowd of music shows, the community of it. Um, and I wanna say that it's not all that different. Like back then I feel like, I don't know, I got a sense that every, everything community wise, you know, culture wise, I, I just had that same connection. Like I was able to relate to what I saw. So I just- yeah, I don't think I don't think it is that much different. Like we, we were going to shows in the, in the mid late nineties, uh, early two thousands. And uh, you know, the shows these days are very similar. And then as we're looking at like this archival footage, like from the eighties and stuff, it looks like shows are kind of similar back right. then as well. Yeah, so that's cool. Yeah. Um, okay. So 
do you have any knack or interest in other artistic avenues? I mean, you do film and media, all that, um, but do you maybe write? Do you um, veer ever from film? No, I mean, that, that's, that's pretty much my MO is that I'm a, uh, like I'm an artist and I do, and film is just like the most recent thing that I've been kind of getting serious into. So um, again, music is more or less like my core. I put out like a bunch of albums under my winter Texan uh, moniker. And, um, but I, all, I write like a ton of poetry. That's how I know Dr. Carmona. Um, so I've been writing for a long, long time as well. Um, that's something I'm working on right now is trying to finish up a, a book of poetry. Um, and, um, and a lot of different art. Like I do, I make a lot of art, uh, like visual art. I made, I made them paintings, drawings, and installations, like uh, things that people can kind of like, environments that people can kind of walk into or walk through, um, interactive art. Um, so yeah, I, I do a lot of different stuff. And, and um, at some point um, before we wrap up, I'd like to show maybe some of it because uh, we made a, uh, or I made a, a, a Loteria set um, for As I Walk Through the Valley. And so that, that was just like some, um, art output that went along with this film as a as sort of like turned into our t-shirts and and some of our our imagery and stuff uh, posters and and uh, merch and stuff like that but um, but yeah I do I do a lot of art and some of it was for this for this film um, did you want to go ahead and show us some of that now did you do you have it yeah. available yeah I can I can actually share the screen so yeah, cool. let me let me show you real quick um, so I'll just come to the, um, this is my, is my Twitter. Let me, let me move over to, so this is the Loteria that, um, that I made and um, zoom in just a little bit here. Um, it's got like our, our kind of like our, our title there, but um, what's interesting about the Loteria is that it has a little bit of the people, a little bit of the food, a little bit of the plants, and, and it's kind of like a sampler of the region. Um, and so I wanted to take things from the region. This is like from a show poster. This is from a, a, a radio, uh, a very important radio station that we talk about. This is Steve Jordan. Um, I wanted to take things from the movie, this uh, from the 90s era, 98 in particular, and put them into the, into the Loteria, you know, kind of reimagining the Loteria itself. This is a record label um, that we talked about, the convention center. This is also from the flyer, Club X from the 90s. Freddy Fender, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there's, um, there's like a way to immediately kind of connect with some of the region um, through, uh, through this thing. Um, so that's, um, the, that's the, uh, the Loteria. And um, can I show you a couple other things real quick? Yeah, of course. So that, that can be found um, on our soundtrack. So uh, we have a, a Medium article that kind of stands as our soundtrack. There's a playlist right here that has like 50, 50 of the songs from the, from the thing. But this is kind of like a, a fuller write-up of, um, uh, of the thing and some, some images from like this is from the 60s. Uh, it, so, so it's write-ups and descriptions of some of the songs, some of the bands. Uh, and you know, it's, kind of, it's kind of long and it, and it kind of keeps on going through the different eras. Um, but um, this is like the first punk band in the valley, the steroids, and uh, one of the songs that we feature, Hey Mr. President. Very cool song, and we have a live, a live version of that one. Uh, this is a, a couple of the uh, promoters um, from the 80s era. Um, so there's a, a big write-up uh, that you can find online, uh, IPM, another great band from the 90s. Uh, we're also on IMDb. This is our IMDb page, so you can check that out, uh, give us a rating. We're on Amazon Prime. If you want to watch the movie, uh, you can see it on Amazon Prime. Um, we're on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, <clears throat> but we're on Instagram. Um, we have a website, but I mean, we use a lot of social media, and, and not just, we haven't posted too much um, stuff on here recently from, from this one, but it's because we've moved into our new projects. So Pansy Pachanga is the next one, and uh, that one is being made. Uh, my co-director in Pansy Pachanga is Gabriel Sanchez, and um, they're really the main, he's kind of like the heart of this project. He, he's done the research, and um, uh, he's, he's really deeply involved with the, uh, the LGBTQI community, 
and um, and has been doing just this incredible job on, on our Instagram of, uh, of kind of posting uh, all this really interesting um, history from the from the um, LGBT community in the valley. So this is going to be similar uh, in this uh, photo of Gabriel right there. Um, that's the right there in the middle, and Charlie. Um, but uh, uh, this one is almost done. We've been working on this one for a couple of years now as well. And um, uh, we, we've shot about 80 interviews plus on this one. And um, we just kind of need to finish this one up in terms of the editing. And then um, <laughs> the last thing I'll mention here is uh, my, my latest documentary project is a documentary series. Um, and um, I had just started with this one right before lockdown happened, right before quarantine started. Uh, but I'm doing some interviews on a documentary series uh, called 11,000 Years of History in the Rio Grande Valley. And um, this is a more general history. So first one was music, the second one was uh, LGBT history, and this one is gonna be uh, a general history of the region. Um, and so uh, I have an Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter for, for this one as well. Um, and we're just kinda, I'm just kinda getting started with, uh, with this one. Um, but uh, I hope to continue as soon as lockdown uh, is, is over or things are getting a little bit safer um, to continue working on this one. But, but I wanted to start with the Native American history because really people have been here for 11,000 years um, at least because we see our archaeological evidence of that. Uh, and, uh, and nobody's really told that kind of longer story of the region. We're such an old place. Um, like Reynosa is a super old city. Um, the, the whole valley area is such an old and, and very, very interesting um, place. And so this is, the, this is the next project. So I just wanna talk about that. Um, I am, <laughs> since we are in lockdown, I am I'm making a website here. So uh, this is all related to COVID-19. So I have a lot of data that I've been collecting about COVID-19 here in the valley. This is my current project uh, as, as I'm uh, kind of twiddling my thumbs in, in lockdown. But uh, trying to stay busy and trying to stay on top of uh, what's been happening out here and just kind of tracking the cases day by day. Um, the overall cases, we're at like uh, 723 positive at the moment, some, some in recovery. But, um, but yeah, this is, this is something I've been kind of like working on um, uh, since, uh, since lockdown started. But, but yeah, I just want to show you those things. Um, and then that's my Twitter in case anybody wants to follow that. And I'll come back to my screen here. Okay, yeah, but I just wanted to kind of mention those those projects. Okay, so I think this might be the la the last question, right? Because we're our our official last question you already answered right now, which is your current work that are, you're working on right now. So I guess we'll just ask the this last question. Might you have any advice for anyone aspiring to film make and do the things that you set out to do yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think it's the same advice most filmmakers give, which is just like, just start making film, you know, grab a camera, whatever camera you have, and just start trying to, to put stuff together, and you're going to learn a lot as you go. And that's, that's exactly the way it's gone with us. Like, start off with whatever camera was available for Pains of Pachanga, we've, we've really upgraded. I'm um, going to be shooting in 4K now. been learning a ton about, like, lights and color and other uh, of the details in, in terms of cinematography as, as you go. And then, um, you know, use a, use a template of some kind. Use a, um, look, at, look at stuff that you like. That's kind of how we um, uh, approached uh, as I walked through the valley. Um, like I was, I was unsure as to how to cut a feature. So I started looking at documentaries and I just started taking really detailed notes on these films and like, okay, how often do they transition from cut to cut? How long do they stay in a person? How often is music underneath? Like really like fine, uh, looking at the fine details and then just kind of uh, reverse engineering that and then putting that into our film, the way that we cut our film. And I think, um, I think that's really um, been a, a really helpful starting point. I will say though, um, one thing I would like to mention in terms of current projects, I've been doing, I've, come back to doing more video journalism. So I've done a lot of stuff with Texas Public Radio um, in this last year. Um, I've been working with a, with a photographer and videographer named uh, Veronica Cardenas and, um, uh, and a reporter named uh, Renato Leanos. And um, 
And we, we did a, a series of, um, of short videos about the border ever since like, um, I think even before family separation, but maybe a little bit after the family separation policy, the zero tolerance policy, we worked on a whole series of videos um, for Texas Public Radio. And so those are, those are currently out there and I'm kind of proud of some of those because I think, I think some of them look really beautiful. Uh, it was really interesting uh, working with a, a photographer because um, of her eye. She has a really great eye and, um, and, and uh, just like working with somebody else's perspective on, on how to get images, I think has been very helpful. Um, but that's also some of my current work that, that's currently out there. Okay, well that concludes our brief interview. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for taking the time. Again, I just wanna say that because the world is a stressful place right now. And I don't know where your mind is at, but mine is all over the place. So I very for much- For sure, agree. for sure. It's very distracting. It's hard to concentrate, it's hard to work right now. Right. And uh, yeah, so I, I appreciate you guys uh, uh, even, uh, even working on, on taking time to do yeah. the interview. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. Have a great day. Okay, Ashley and Jessa, y'all have a nice day. You too. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.